Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome to Do Fat Jokes and Memes Motivate People to Lose Weight? Well, I hope you can tell what my opinion is by my tone. Um, we're thrilled that you can join us today. We're going to keep this to what is called a meeting format in Zoom, which is a little bit new for, my, for us um, as opposed to a webinar. This is going to allow for more engagement so that you feel part of the community here at Obesity Canada. Um, and during these times of COVID, we need community more than ever. So we're going to start this discussion with Dr. Arya Sharman and Jimena Ramos Salas, and they're going to talk for about 15 minutes on this. And then we're going to reserve about 15 minutes for your questions. And we really want to hear from you. So let me do a little bit of housekeeping and give you a tour of Zoom if Zoom is um, new to you. So know that this session is recorded. Um, and if you really, really don't want your image part of this recording, you can turn your video off. And so how do you do that? If you roam your mouse along the bottom left-hand side, you'll see something that says start video, stop video. So you would just click that and your image will not be part of the video, but your name will be. There's no way not to have your name being recorded. Um, but we do hope you keep your camera on because it uh, definitely lends to that sense of community and interaction and great discussion. The second important point to note is be sure to be on mute. We, it's really hard to have a conversation with background noise. And again, if you roam your mouse at the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a microphone there and always be sure that you're on mute. You'll be able to unmute you or I will be able to unmute you as well during the Q&A period so that we can hear your voice. And I want everybody to roam their mouse along the bottom and hit something called manage participants. So when you hit manage participants, you'll be able to find your name along the, the panel and you can virtually raise your hand. That way I know to call on you for a question. If you can't figure that out technically, do not worry. I can see everybody across the screen. You can just do it the old fashioned way and I'll definitely call on you. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Arya Sharman. He is the scientific director of Obesity Canada. Well, thank you, Sandra, for that introduction. And uh, uh, you know, we're still we're still all learning here. So I think it's uh, uh, it's perhaps a good opportunity to remind everybody why Obesity Canada is actually putting on this series. And this has to do with the fact uh, that we, you know, apparently have two epidemics now. We've got the obesity, the good old obesity epidemic, if you want to call it that. Uh, and now we have the COVID-19 epidemic. And uh, as we are seeing is the two interact together, uh, which really basically means that uh, uh, you know, we are actually starting to see that uh, having obesity uh, may actually affect, uh, you know, some of the risk that you have with, uh, uh, you know, with COVID-19 should you have an infection. Uh, now, we've talked about this before in some of the past video, uh, videos and seminars, and so you will find those on the Obesity Canada website. Uh, now, just to remind everybody, in case you're not familiar with Obesity Canada, Obesity Canada is Canada's national uh, registered charity and is entirely dedicated to improving the lives of Canadians through obesity research, uh, education, advocacy. Uh, and Obesity Canada does a lot of things uh, focusing on the education of health professionals. It supports researchers and mentors, trainees and students. Uh, it works with policymakers uh, to ensure that all Canadians living with obesity receive the same uh, level of prevention and care as Canadians living with other chronic diseases such as diabetes or hypertension. Now, on today's uh, chat, we want to focus on this whole issue around uh, weight bias, weight discrimination, uh, fat jokes, uh, you know, are they, are, they, are they beneficial, are they not? Uh, as probably most of you know, Obesity Canada has always been very vocal about, uh, you know, on the issue of weight bias and discrimination. And it's a great pleasure today to uh, be chatting with Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Jimena Ramos-Sales, uh, who has a long history uh, with Obesity Canada. She was, uh, for many years, Obesity Canada's uh, uh, executive director. She has also, she's currently in charge of obesity's uh, research and policy, uh, but she also has a PhD in public health, and her PhD work has focused very much on the issue of weight bias and discrimination. So, Jimena, welcome to, the, to, to, to today's uh, chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma, and thank you everybody for being here today. 
So Jimena, why don't we start off by you telling us a little bit about your, uh, well, your involvement with Obesity Canada, obviously, but also uh, focusing perhaps on, you know, on your research background, which really focused on uh, the topic of obesity and uh, weight bias, weight discrimination. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your research. Sure. So um, I started working in obesity uh, around in the early 2000s, and um, my whole background and training has been in uh, uh, nursing, health promotion, and public health. And uh, throughout my career as a, in education, in all those professions, I have never really been trained on obesity as a chronic disease. And the, the things that I learned in my undergraduate school or in my graduate programs was that obesity is really a self-inflicted chronic um, risk factor, right? And so, and then I started working with Obesity Canada and I started talking to people living with obesity and learning about the science about obesity and realized that there's a major gap in terms of uh, our understanding scientifically about obesity and how we talk about obesity in public health. And so I started asking myself, why is it that in public health, we talk about obesity as a lifestyle risk factor and not as a chronic disease? And what are the unintended consequences of having this narrative in public health for people living with obesity? And so my PhD focus on that um, uh, is the simplistic narrative of obesity as a risk factor, creating more weight bias and stigma uh, in our society. And how can we make sure that our public health narrative is, is more evidence-based? So Jimena, can you give us uh, a few examples of some of the main findings from your research? Sure. So I did um, several studies. One of them was a policy analysis. So I reviewed all obesity prevention policies across the country, across every province and territory, as well as the federal government. And I did a critical analysis to see what the narrative is in these policies and how this narrative frames obesity. And what I discovered was that many of the public health policies that we have in Canada tend to frame obesity as a choice, as a risk factor for other chronic diseases, but not as a chronic disease in itself. It also uh, frames obesity as a behavioral uh, risk factor. Um, and a lot of the interventions are framed around teaching and promoting healthy eating and promoting more physical activity at the population level so that we can prevent obesity. And there was very little talk about um, how do we treat obesity as a chronic disease and how do we engage people living with obesity in public health policies. So, so, so overall, let me, yeah. Uh, let me interrupt right there. I mean, most people would actually look at obesity as being, you know, and they would say the public health people are right because this is largely a question perhaps of, uh, you know, eating too much and not moving, uh, not moving enough. And that is the, that is the dominant narrative. So what is the science uh, you know, that challenges this narrative? And why is it that we today look at obesity as a chronic disease rather than simply as a lifestyle risk factor? Yeah, well, we know uh, from public health systems thinking that there's been many studies, and I think many of you may be familiar with the foresight map. Um, and basically this uh, study identifies over 300 factors that contribute to a person gaining weight. And they range from individual behavior factors all the way to bio biology and physiology, all the way to physical environmental factors, uh, psychology, mental health, many, many different factors who act that actually interact. So it's 300 different factors interacting to cause somebody to gain weight. So the idea of diet and exercise is a very simplistic way of, you know, discussing obesity when we don't, when we don't talk about the other 298 factors that are interacting to create obesity. So let's, uh, you know, let's, let's try to clear up some confusion in the terms. So, so I, I myself often you know, sometimes use these terms interchangeably, but they're actually quite different. So when you talk about weight bias and you talk about, uh, uh, you know, when you talk about stigma and when you talk about discrimination, those are actually very different issues. So uh, yeah. from your perspective, can you just take us through those terms and what they actually mean and how they should be used? Yeah, I do use them differently only because it helps me determine what kind of actions we need at different levels. So weight bias uh, refers to our individual attitudes and beliefs about obesity and about weight. Uh, so these are our beliefs that we hold inside ourselves and are either un implicit or explicit, right? And then weight stigma. So, so can you, can you, can you, sorry, can you just explain yeah. implicit and explicit? 
Right, so implicit is unconscious. You're not even aware that you have some way bias in you. Explicit is when you express your beliefs openly and talk negatively about people living with obesity, right? And then uh, obesity stigma or weight stigma uh, is more about the social stereotypes that we have in our society that are deeply ingrained in our society. You know, beliefs that people with obesity are lazy, um, unintelligent, lacking willpower, ugly, you know, uh, there's a lot of stereotypes that we have in our society that we um, see every day in the media, in, uh, on TV, in entertainment news, you name it. And then there's weight-based discrimination. And for me, that is when weight bias, our individual weight bias and the social stereotypes, the stigma is combined to make us act against people living with obesity in a negative way. When we treat people in a different way, when we treat them inequitably or when we treat them differently. Um, and so discrimination to me is more of an action, right? So weight bias is like attitudes and beliefs, stigma is social stereotypes, and weight-based discrimination is when we do something against people living with obesity. So perhaps one of the most uh, interesting uh, and sometimes confusing findings is this whole issue around internalized bias. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain that term and, and, and what it means and why, why recognizing internalized bias is so important. Yeah, I think uh, uh, there's more and more studies um, uh, coming uh, and emerging, but we know that weight bias is deeply ingrained um, everywhere in our society. So it would make sense that people who have excess weight or who have obesity would internalize some of these biased beliefs and social stereotypes and start believing that this is true about themselves. And so weight, internalized weight bias refers to when people with obesity or people who live in larger bodies uh, believe that the disrespect or the mistreatment that they get is deserved and that uh, obesity is their fault and that they should be able to control their weight. And uh, if people treat them unfairly, it's justifiable because they haven't been able to control themselves to manage their own weight. Okay, and so now that there has been increased awareness of this, and, uh, and you know, I might just uh, remind the viewers that you were actually one of the principal authors of a very important position paper that came out from the European uh, World Health Organization uh, that actually talked about the issue of weight bias and weight discrimination, not just you know, saying it's bad uh, mm -hmm. and maybe shouldn't be socially acceptable, but actually pointed to some real health risks uh, for people living with obesity as a direct result of uh, you know, weight bias or discrimination. Uh, can you just tell us you know, what the rationale for that paper was and what some of those findings tell us? Yeah, so I think there's this uh, misconception uh, in the public and in the healthcare community that if we make somebody feel bad about their weight, that will motivate their behavior change. And so if we um, tell the world that obesity is bad for you, that obesity is a burden on the healthcare system, that that somehow will trigger some behavior change in individuals to promote um, weight loss or to get people to, be, to mo get motivated to lose weight. And so when I was working uh, with WHO about uh, how do we, uh, address weight bias in public health policies, one of the things that we discovered was that a lot of healthcare professionals actually adopted this weight, weight bias beliefs in their practice and believed that it was okay to shame their patients for their weight and say, um, you know, uh, if you don't lose weight, you're going to die. Or if you don't lose weight, you're going to sick. So WHO felt it was important to have some kind of policy statement about that. Yeah, uh, but just as an example, I mean, the, the scare technique or, you know, has, has been a common instrument in public health. I mean, you know, when you, when you put those images on cigarette packages, which are supposed to scare people away from using them, uh, when you, you know, the whole don't use drug campaign is all about, it's all about scaring people and shaming people and making it socially unacceptable. So isn't this sort of the usual public health playbook? Uh, that they then just took and also applied to obesity. Uh, and, uh, you know, and you could argue whether it's worked for the other conditions, but what is the particular problem when you take those kind of approaches, which have apparently, you know, been around in public health, and, you know, in the public health okay. toolbox for a long time, and now you're taking those same techniques and you're applying them to obesity. Why, why are those techniques suddenly wrong? or ineffective? Well, those techniques have been criticized in smoking cessation and uh, other uh, areas of public health. 
uh, because uh, the idea of shaming uh, somebody to promote behavior change is unproven. We have no scientific evidence that if you shame somebody that they will change their behavior. In fact, the opposite is true. Uh, right? If you shame somebody, if you make somebody feel really bad about their behaviors and about their health, they are more likely to uh, engage in negative behaviors, in negative health behaviors. And in obesity, we know that, right? But I think public health has been, um, you know, kind of been stuck in this reductionist approach to health promotion, right? Where we focus a lot on talking to the individuals about what to do to change their behavior rather than taking assistance approach and thinking about what are the interventions that we need to take at the societal level to make sure that everybody's healthy. And so that reductionist individualistic approach has been criticized in public health for many years. Um, but in obesity, it tends to be going uncriticized, unquestioned. It tends to be believed that this is the way to do it because, um, and I've talked to many public health policymakers who who honestly have been trained in this model that um, obesity is a simplistic uh, um, energy in, energy out. And all we need to do is educate individuals about how to eat healthy and how to exercise and that we won't have this problem if we teach everybody to do that. And so I got trained on that, right? In my health promotion degree, I got trained on that in my kinesiology degree, right? So we all have been trained in this dogma. So I think we need to criticize it. Yeah, so I want just to wanna interrupt and let you know we're at the 15 minute mark. Okay. Really? I, yeah, thanks, <laughs> thanks Sandra. So uh, him and I, I wanna come you know, to the actual, uh, you know, part of the reason why we are having this discussion today. And that has been the appearance of a number of, uh, you know, jokes and memes uh, all over social media, uh, kind of, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, making fun of, the fact that we're all stuck indoors and that some of us yeah. might be struggling with our, you know, trying to control our food intake and that weights might be going up. And I've heard the term, the, the, the COVID-15 being thrown around. Uh, and, uh, you know, and people put up these memes A, because they think they're funny, but B, also perhaps there might be the belief that if you put these things up, somehow we are going to, again, you know, shame and force people to maybe think twice about their behaviors and actually change their behaviors. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 you know, let's spend the last couple of minutes here and then sure. we'll open this up to the audience. Uh, just talking about your thoughts on this. So when you see these, you know, the fat jokes, these memes, uh, you know, people that people are putting out there, w w what goes through your mind as someone who's actually studied this topic? Well, for me, it, it shows how deeply ingrained weight bias is in our society, right? The idea that um, we're experiencing a major pandemic uh, of an infectious disease and what we worry about is gaining a few pounds seems over the top and seems um, a little bit um, out of touch in terms of our health and well-being. Uh, also, the idea that you know we can make fun of people who have obesity is so deeply ingrained that everybody thinks it's okay to put fat memes on their Facebook and on their Instagram. And everybody thinks that, you know, uh, nobody, everybody's going to laugh and people do. Most people just laugh and think, yep, yeah, that's me. I'm going to eat a lot because I'm stressed and I'm going to gain a few pounds. And, um, and I think the, the fear is, um, is that people feel that if they do gain weight during this pandemic, they're going to fit into this category of people who have obesity or people who live in larger bodies. And the assumptions that we have about those people is that these people are unmotivated, unsuccessful, lacking willpower. And so people don't want to belong to that category, right? And so it's a fear of belonging to this us versus them, them right? So we don't want to belong to this group of people that is undervalued in our society. We don't value people who have obesity or who live in, ex, uh, in larger bodies. We think that they are lower um, down in our priority list. And so uh, I think that's the anxiety that people have about gaining weight is that, oh, if I gain weight, um, I'm going to all of a sudden belong to this category of people that people in our side don't like. Right. And so that's what I don't I think we need to question that because uh, that is deeply ingrained in our weight bias beliefs that people with obesity are not smart. People with obesity are not successful. They don't have good careers. They're not beautiful. Right. And those are all assumptions that we make, but are completely 
unfounded, right, in any evidence and in, in, in how we live with people. And we're all equal human beings. We all have the same human value. Doesn't matter what size we are. Okay, on that note, uh, why don't we just open this up for, for discussion and questions from the audience. And if there's anybody yeah, in the audience there who has a question, uh, you can just, uh, uh, you can write it down or even better, you know, we'll just switch to you and uh, Sandra will make sure that you can, you can ask your question. Yeah. Yeah, so the floor is open for any questions that you may have or comments that you may want to share. And you can either virtually raise your hand or you can just do it the old fashioned way and I can see you raise your hand. Any questions out there? I think I would like to start with a question, Humana. I, uh, my family, in my family, there's uh, quite a few people who live with obesity. And I have witnessed the internalized bias um, bring them to a point where they cannot advocate for themselves and accept treatment that is completely unacceptable. Um, and I have a hard time getting them to see that, that they just accept it. And so um, I have gone along on appointments with loved ones, but I, I want a better way to advocate for people that I care about that are living with obesity and um, don't know how to stand up for themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I hear you, Sandra. I think um, um, I have um, family members who have obesity as well, many friends, and it's, it's almost impossible for all of us to not know somebody who has obesity uh, in our society. And I think um, what I hear a lot from, um, especially now during the pandemic, uh, is that, you know, we know from in general, in normal circumstances, people who have internalized weight bias will uh, be less likely to seek treatment for um, various conditions because of fear of being blamed and shamed for their weight in healthcare settings. So we have an extensive evidence that if you have internalized weight bias, you will, not, you will be less likely to seek help in the healthcare system. And so the question is, we don't have the data on this, the question is, if people are experiencing that internalized weight bias, right now during this pandemic, is it preventing them from seeking help for their COVID symptoms if they have COVID? And that could have severe implications for the health of our population because we're talking about millions of people uh, who have obesity in Canada. And if those people feel that, you know, I'm going to wait a little longer, I'm not that sick because I really don't want to go and see a doctor or a nurse about it because I'm going to hear the same thing over and over again. You know, oh, you're just, you just have a cold and you need to go and lose weight. So people don't want to experience that. And I understand why people don't want to experience that. But at this point, we don't have the studies to show whether that is happening right now. But um, based on my discussions anecdotally with people, there's a lot of anxiety about going out to get help. Yeah, I would agree with that. So the floor is open for questions. And if you've ever been on any of my Zooms, you know eventually I just pick on Adriana. Adriana. <laughs> Who? Adriana. Hi, Adriana. Oh, hello. Who did somebody? Oh, I see a hand. Okay, I've unmuted you. And Adriana, you're you're good to go. Ask your question. Hi. Guys. hi. So I just want to say hi you guys. Hi. Uh, it's good to see so, you. It's not really a question. I guess I was just, I was just wanted to make a comment for anyone. Adriana, can you speak closer to, to your microphone? Adriana, you need to speak a little Is bit. Is this better? Yeah. Much better. Yeah. Just and a, little a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that I actually had a friend who stopped eating and had a panic attack because of a meme that somebody posted. Mm -hmm. So what Jimena is saying is like, it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting how it really does affect people. So she stopped eating because of fear of gaining weight. Yep. Because of a post, because of the COVID, because of the COVID thing, she had ended up having a panic attack because of everything. Yeah. So I guess that's, that's kind of what um, I'm thinking about. That's one of the unintended consequences of, you know, we see these fat memes and people don't want to gain weight and then they start doing these drastic diets or unevidence-based un weight loss programs. And then that could cause more health consequences in the long term. And I think Dr. Sharma could probably talk more about, you know, you know doing all these um, uh, fat diets that, you know, don't really work and are not evidence-based. Yeah. I'm going to move over to Jessica. Hi, Jessica. You had a question? 
Hi, this is really great, by the way. This is like, oh. this is such a great, important conversation. And I, the last thing you said, Jimena, is, is really interesting, which is, you know, with all the headlines emerging um, about weight related to COVID, um, I, I'm really, I, I, I do fear this sudden influx of everyone and their mother basically proposing, you know, immediate diets that everyone should do. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, Dr. Sharma, what you think, you know, do you see and do you fear that that's going to happen? Is just this influx of marketing around that. And how do you think, you know, we can combat that with the appropriate information? Uh, well, thanks, Jessica, for that question. I think you're right. Uh, you know, a lot of people, are, as they start coming out of this, are going to uh, probably say, well, now it's time to get you know, fit again, and it's going, it's going to be time to start losing weight. Uh, and I think, you know, it's the same phenomenon you see basically every January, right? Every January, suddenly mm -hmm. people come out and they realize, well, you know, now may be the time to start making changes. And what we learned from most of those changes is that, that when people, you know, try to make those kind of changes, very often, the, 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 you know, the first mistake they make, usually the changes are too drastic. Uh, so you, you know, you try to completely change everything in your life because you're trying to be, you know, you're trying to control your weight or whatever it is. Uh, and what we've learned from all of the behavioral change literature is that the more drastic the change, the less likely you're going to be to stick with it. Uh, and that is important in the context of obesity management or weight management because we know that this is chronic, right? I mean, the short term, you know, I often said, you know, you know losing your weight through, a, through an extreme diet is basically like holding your breath. You know, your body is going to compensate for that uh, at some point. You know, no matter the diet, you're going to stop losing weight. And the day you come off the diet, the, dates, the weight's going to come back. So if it's not sustainable, and if this is not how you want to live for the rest of your life, well, then it's almost like don't bother because it's not going to, be, it's not going to work. You know, that's just normal biology. Uh, and so, yes, I think you're right that we are going to be seeing more interest in quick weight loss. You know, I put them on, you know, I put on the weight in four weeks, so why can't I lose them in four weeks? Well, you can lose them in four weeks, but unfortunately, a lot of that weight is probably going to come back, uh, you know, very quickly. So uh, it's the same dilemma. You've got to change your mindset around obesity. And, you know, and, you know, and this also brings us to the topic, does everybody need to lose weight? Because, you know, like, like Obesity Canada always says, you don't measure health by stepping on a scale and, and, and the, you know, the clinical definition of obesity is not what's your BMI. It is, it's really, is your body weight or your body fat affecting your health? And if it's not, then maybe you shouldn't be worrying about it in the first place. Mm -hmm. I and think was, think, sorry, I was going to ask Dr. Sharma one question. What do you think that the uh, long-term consequences are of people doing these yo-yo diets and mm -hmm. losing weight and gaining weight and well, well, the scientific literature on that is, is, is somewhat controversial because, uh, you know, it hasn't been bulk captured. You need good, very good longitudinal studies to actually figure out whether somebody who's gone through repeated weight cycles, uh, whether that has health benefit. But I can tell you, and maybe Sandra can tell us, uh, there is absolutely no doubt that weight cycling has huge emotional, uh, uh, you know, you know, emotional challenges for people who keep going through this, because essentially through every weight loss cycle, you're proving your, to yourself, uh, you know, that you're a failure and that you failed again, that you're a disappointment. And that does not make things work because you're already struggling with self-esteem. You already have implicit weight bias. You already have internalized weight bias. And now you're just proving to yourself again. All right. So here we go again. And I've just shown that I, that I'm simply not strong enough to do this. Yeah. Uh, Sandra, you might want to comment on this. So true, you know, especially if you've struggled with your weight and eating for years, and for me, decades, um, when I, you've tried really hard at something and you keep failing, you tend to internalize that you're the failure. And a big shift that I made was that I'm not the failure. It was in fact those diets that had failed me. There was no chance ever that those diets gonna, were gonna work. So it had nothing to do with me. That was definitely a big shift for me. And I also want to comment on these notions um, I find there's this one notion that says, oh, you know, we're in self-quarantine, so we should be writing a book, and we should be training hard, and we should start a new business, and we should, like, this, you know, this has got to be a time of high production, or this should be a time where you accomplish nothing. Um, and really, it's everyone needs to decide what works for them. And so a good barometer is how you feel at the end of the day. So if at the end of the day, if you've been super productive, you feel really good, then that's a sign that that's probably the best thing for you. Or if you try to be too productive and you don't feel good by the end of the day, maybe that's not the best. 
and really finding your new normal that makes you feel good. So I know that we have another question, another hand up from Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Um, so thank you very much. This is an amazing discussion. My question is around um, the fact that we're seeing that the government is pushing through a lot of new legislation in a whole bunch of different areas. Um, so there's some new rules out there. Things are um, being dictated now in a much quicker way than we've seen in the past. So is this an opportunity because of the reported link between COVID-19 and obesity is now an opportunity to leverage some of that link and the crisis around that to push through some new legislation and some new policy that will help Canadians living in larger bodies? Yeah, I... I think, you know, so that's one of the reasons why I talk about weight bias, weight stigma, and weight-based discrimination, because I think we need action at individual level, at community level, and at the policy level. Um, so uh, one of the policy implications that I see um, is that right now in the middle of the pandemic, and we've seen it in other uh, situations like in the uh, um, uh, natural disasters that happen in, uh, in New Orleans and other places, where um, the healthcare system was not prepared uh, for either doing surveillance on obesity or uh, supporting people living with obesity through those uh, situations, right? And so what are the policies that we can set in place now to make sure that if, you know, this is probably gonna continue for a little bit longer, um, maybe a lot longer, but uh, how do we make sure that the healthcare system can have policies in place to provide support for people living with obesity, uh, both so that they have, you know, um, they feel more comfortable reaching out for care, but also both in terms of uh, managing their disease and helping them self-manage their disease and continue their obesity treatments throughout this pandemic, just like any other chronic disease. So whether you have diabetes or hypertension, right now it's very important that all those people are being able to manage their disease uh, continuously, otherwise they will be at more risk for developing more severe COVID symptoms. So how are we supporting patients living with obesity right now? I, uh, I, I am based here in Sweden and I see a lot of European colleagues who are telling me that obesity clinics are being uh, postponed. Uh, many doctors are saying they cannot open their clinics. So what happens to all those people living with obesity who don't have access to obesity treatments right now? Mm -hmm. That's a form of discrimination. It's an unintended consequence of not having the right policies in place and not recognizing that obesity is a chronic disease, I think. And what can we do as individuals to help you push those policies through faster? Advocate, like Sandra was saying. <laughs> so how do we, how do we, you know, so I have had many discussions with um, uh, friends and family who have obesity and uh, who tell me, you know, um, uh, I went to the hospital, I never got tested. Um, I had all the symptoms, the doctor just told me to go home. And, and I said, you know, so well, why, why didn't you speak about it? Why didn't you say something about it? It's like, well, because I think they're doing that to everybody. It's not just me. And, um, and I think that's true, probably that a lot of people, you know, we don't really know what's happening in the healthcare system um, in terms of testing, but um, I feel that a lot of people with obesity feel that it is not their right to ask for, for more care or for the right care because um, they don't wanna be a burden on the healthcare system. And so sometimes I'm a little afraid that all these research that comes out that says that obesity is a higher uh, risk factor for developing more severe complications of COVID that that's gonna position people with obesity as being a burden to the healthcare system. And we don't want that, uh, but we also want people to feel that it is the right to advocate for the right care um, and that like anybody else living with a chronic disease, they have the right to ask their healthcare providers for respectful, non-judgmental, um, evidence-based treatments. Yeah. Thank you. So, so, if, uh, so if, I can, if I can just chip in. So Rachel, I mean, you know, the, uh, the issue is absolutely on the table. I mean, there's no doubt that people living with obesity are at increased risk from COVID-19. However, uh, in the same way that after the lockdown, we don't want everybody running out on, you know, you know, but doing fad diets. Uh, we also have to be careful of not being too opportunistic right now, mm -hmm. because we do know that the COVID-19 is putting a lot of pressure on policymakers, but it's also putting a lot of pressure on, on frontline, you know, 
healthcare professionals who right now have other things to worry about if you, if, you know, if you want to be fair. So it's not just that they're not worrying about obesity, but they're also not worrying about people who, who have cancer and heart attacks mm -hmm. and other things, other non-acute problems. So I think, uh, again, to be fair to the health care settings and authorities, now might not right, be the right time to start saying, well, you have to start thinking about obesity as a chronic disease. Oh. On the other hand, we're in this for the long game. I mean, Obesity Canada is here mm -hmm. to stay. Uh, you know, we are not just asking, well, what happens to people with obesity next month or next week or even next year? But, you know, we, this is a chronic disease. It's not going away. We need to put in, put in set, you know, the, you know, the policies that are evidence-based, uh, both on the prevention side and on the management side. And uh, right now, Obesity Canada is, uh, is just in the process of finalizing and hopefully launching the new Canadian Obesity Clinical Management Guidelines. And these should be out very shortly in the next, you know, in the next few weeks or months. Uh, and I think they put a context to this whole discussion that when this whole COVID thing is over, uh, we're still going to have obesity and we're still going mm -hmm. to have obesity. There's not going to be a vaccination for obesity. There's not going to be a magic cure. Uh, and we do have to play the long game here, which means uh, the least we can advocate for is that people with obesity uh, have the same access to treatments uh, yeah. as everybody else who has any other chronic disease. So it's not that people with obesity are asking for more than say no. someone who has diabetes or someone who has cancer or someone who's got any, any other health problem. Uh, they just want it to be, to be treated equally and fairly. Uh, yeah. And I think that is, uh, you know, that's what Obesity Canada is trying to achieve. Uh, through all of our activity. And, and you asked, what can you do as an individual? Well, as an individual, I think, uh, you know, you can contribute, talk to your doctor about it, talk to your family about it, talk to your friends about it. Uh, don't repost the fat jokes on social media. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I think all of these things over time are going to help. And ultimately, I think what, what is really going to help, and we've seen this in a lot of disease areas, is having a strong uh, organization that never stops lobbying. And that is exactly what Obesity Canada does. Yeah. Uh, and so on that note, perhaps if we don't see any more questions, I noticed that, you know, this has gone much longer than we actually thought it would go. Uh, yes, we, we do have two more questions. If all right, let's take, let's sure. take them. I and we'll take, these are the last two. So Veronica typed in the chat box, what do you think about people making jokes about gaining weight in the lockdown? Do you think this minimizes the importance of genes, eating, behavior, and willpower? Well, most definitely, I think um, it goes back to that fundamental idea that people gain weight because they eat too much and they don't exercise. And those are fundamentally two beliefs that contribute to weight bias and stigma in our society, right? If you continue to talk about um, eat less, move more, you know, um, change your behavior, uh, and, and talk about obesity in a very simplistic way without talking about the genetics, without talking about the physiological factors, the medications we're taking that promote weight gain, all of these other factors that contribute to weight gain, then we continue to feed into that belief, belief that obesity is self-inflicted and that we can control our weight. And weight is not a behavior, right? Weight is, uh, you know, a symptom of behavioral and other genetic factors. It's not just, a, it's not a behavior that we can control. And so we have to move away from this idea that we have 100% control of our weight because we don't. No, important point. I really like that. Weight is not a behavior we can control. Last question is uh, Natalie. Natalie, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, hi. Um, hi, Natalie. Um, I just want to, do the bridge with the uh, burning on the system and the cost of obesity. And sometimes I think like it's a confrontation with the stigmatization Then you will cause and that you see like the big fingers of the uh, daddy state and say, you will cause and you will bring eat on the system. And on the other way, like, we ask people to don't stigmatize and to don't feel like blaming the victim. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's a fine balance. I think at Obesity Canada, um, you know, obviously we know that uh, obesity costs the healthcare system, obesity costs, um, uh, it affects the quality of life of individuals. There is a burden to individuals and society associated with obesity, and we cannot deny that. that. But um, I think, uh, when we talk about this, we should talk about it. this is the disease that's causing the system. It's not people. 
costing the system. It's the disease that is a burden on our society and continuing to ignore the disease or and continuing to not provide evidence-based treatments for this disease contributes to that cost, right? And so if we don't do anything about it, um, uh, you can't just keep blaming the individuals who live with this disease, just like we don't blame other people who have other diseases. Um, so I think the balance has to be, yes, obesity is a disease that costs the healthcare system and it costs society, but it's not the individual's fault. It's not th that the individual is costing the healthcare system, it's their disease, and we need to manage that disease. Thank you. Um, we're out of time. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everybody, but we will have more of these and I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Sharma uh, close us off tonight today. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. Uh, so, Iman, first of all, on behalf of Obesity Canada, I would like to thank all of you for attending this chat. Uh, if you are not familiar with Obesity Canada, you can find out a lot more about what Obesity Canada does on its website. Uh, you can follow up Obesity Canada on social media, everything from Facebook to Instagram to YouTube channels, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, Obesity Canada is a charity, and as a charity, we are dependent on people supporting us. Uh, and this can be virtual support, you know, share the information that you get from here, uh, but also, you know, perhaps financial support. So if any of you, I know these are hard times for everybody, but, you know, they're also hard times for Obesity Canada. So if anybody is willing to make a small donation towards this cause, uh, that would be very, very welcome. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, thanks, Sandra, for the moderation. And thanks, Jimena, for joining uh, us. And I'm sure we'll, we'll see each other again soon. And for those of you interested in donating, the link is in the chat box. So you can grab that link right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody. Bye.